Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the greatest show on earth. I am your Wait, host. This is The Sopranos. Yes, it's we're the sequel that no one asked for. <laughs> <laughs> What's his name? Tony. Tony got sure. shot. Tony died. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I've never seen a single episode of The Sopranos. <laughs> it's the famous ending of The Sopranos, where I, like that's the only thing I know about it. <laughs> yeah. So this episode is just going to end randomly in the middle, and nobody's going to know what the rest of the episode is like. There you go. <laughs> Um, so my name is Patrick and with me as always is my co-host Macadoodle Cooperino. Macadoodle Square, what's up? <laughs> beep, beep, beep. Oh, insert an air horn. So immediately derailing the episode, but um, before we get started, as always, we'd like to thank our patrons who helped the show go. Uh, we're up to seven patrons, which small, but you know, it's fun. Yay. Thank you for uh, supporting us monetarily. Like, what, 20 bucks a month? 21? Yep. yep. That's something. Hey, man. That helps me get pizza. Hell yeah. If you want to help support the show, you can check us out in the links below uh, to on Patreon. For $3 a month, you can get an extra episode per month that's run by Mac. And uh, you can get access to early episodes. So that's cool. All right. Today, I want to start off like by introducing our episode, in a sense, which listeners I'm sure will know because they've read the title of the episode before clicking on it. Um, but to kind of set the scene as to why it's important to talk about this, um, I remember a few weeks ago, a few months ago at this point, I was talking with my supervisor about you know the topic that I was trying uh, that I was developing for my for school, and we mentioned she mentioned major events in um, in Prairie Canadian like history, and she was like, "Well, what's the major event that everyone knows?" And I was like, well, there's a few that come to mind. And she's like, no, there's really one that if you know it, you know it. And if not, that's just, that's it. You, you, you need to get yourself informed on it. And what she was referring to in this case was our topic for today, the Northwest Rebellion. It goes by all kinds of names, the Northwest Resistance, uh, the Louis Riel Resistance. Depends on how you want to frame it. Was this his first or second resistance? This remember. is the second. So, so this Northwest Rebellion Part 2, Riel Boogaloo. Yes. All right. So the first or is it one... Riel Rebellion 2, Northwest Boogaloo? I think Northwest Boogaloo sounds better. All right. <laughs> So um, this is the one that takes place in 1885, right? And mm -hmm. this, I, I think it's important to talk about this specifically after our last episode that we did on the railroad, because I think they're intrinsically related as events. Right? And we'll kind of get into why that is a bit later. But the reason why I think um, my supervisor brought this up as an important and seminal moment is that it's kind of one of the last major armed rebellions against what would become the Canadian state, right, that we would know in Canada, right, and, or at least it's debated as to like whether it was actively against the state or what it represented, but we'll get into that. And also it kind of, especially the aftermath of the resistance, which will be the subject of our next episode. So the trial of Louis Riel, spoilers, um, also kind of encapsulates the divisions in uh, like the multifaceted divisions that exist at the time and still exist to this day in many ways that uh, in Canadian society, because Riel was not only a Métis, so indigenous in a sense, partially indigenous, and he was francophone, right? And so it created a big hodgepodge of bringing to light issues that existed within the burgeoning Canadian state at the time. And his trial kind of encapsulates that mm -hmm. uh, in many ways as Canada is expanding west. So to kind of get us up to speed, you alluded to it is it the first or second rebellion? So we actually talked about the first rebellion before. What do you remember of that one? So that took place in 1869. Um, it happened. John A. McDonald was there. Yes, as he be. He, yeah, he handled it poorly and it cost him the election, didn't it? No. Or it was one of the things? No? It didn't cost him the election, although this one almost does. <laughs> You're right. And then, oh, it was based upon representation, wasn't it? I'm, I'm drawing a lot of blanks. Like, it's a rebellion, you know? It has rebellion things going on. They're angry about stuff. Yeah. And it's the Metis, so it's First Nation issues, which means it's going to be based upon things mm -hmm. like representation, unfair laws. There was a Bill of Rights we looked at at the time that was yeah. really just awful. It was like... I mean, not, it was it was what they wanted, in a sense. No, not sorry. No, I'm sorry. What they wanted was fine. 
but then the response to it oh was awful. yes okay the response yeah yeah mm -hmm. like yeah the because the response was, was basically awful. invasion yeah and then the actual bill of rights itself was fine mm -hmm. they could just wanted like be able to control their shit yeah and then it would so it was so as as these things tend to do it sounds the seeds for more rebellion later on yeah exactly so to kind of pick up on some of the points so yeah the the basic idea was that a lot of the metis populations existed in what is now known as manitoba right um and as western uh, as eastern canada kind of expanded westward there were conflicts that emerged between european settlers and the metis and indigenous populations that were there and that's where you get the conflicts that you're talking about where uh, Louis Riel and others would take up arms against invading what they saw as invading settlers, right, and create a provisional government. I think what's important to remember in this case is that Riel and other Métis peoples were not against joining Canada, right? Mm -hmm. the, the Manitoba Act that was birthed from this uh, conflict was specifically their attempt to say, well, we're joining Canada, but on our terms, right? We want our rights protected. We want our lands protected. We want to be able to participate in the Canadian state and this form of liberal democracy as Métis, right? Mm -hmm. And that means French rights and Indigenous rights and like so on. As we saw a few times, this was thoroughly ignored, right? Or, and kind of went by the wayside very quickly um, <laughs> with, as we actually saw in the language rights uh, episode that we did not too long ago, Mostly through legislation, the ability for French populations, including the Métis, to have education in France or to continue in the way they wanted was kind of pushed to the side, right? Right. So this is where we kind of pick up then in um, in this part de, if you will, of uh, another Métis rebellion, because after the after the um, initial Red River Rebellion, or Red River Resistance, what it was called, Louis Riel flees to the United States, right? Uh, he's not considered welcome in Canada for obvious reasons, because he took up arms against the government. And despite this, he's actually still elected to seats in <laughs> government three times. I mean, that's how it goes, though. Like, <laughs> surprise, surprise, people want the right people fighting for them. Exactly. He's never able to take his seat in uh, in the House of Commons. But theoretically, he is a member of parliament like three times in Canadian history. Um but yeah, we'll get into that. So that Louis kind of Riel stuff. for prime minister from the dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, wackier things have happened. Okay. Yeah. So I think the best way to start uh, this episode, right, is by setting up a bit. So by 1875, the Euro Canadians, right, which had been the kind of people who were encroaching on the Red River territory that would become Manitoba, um, had pretty much overrun. The, mm -hmm. the area. The Métis were no longer a major population that, uh, in, that, uh, in that territory or province. And Winnipeg and other cities were pretty much just Canadian cities at that point. Right? Um, and the Métis, who were disenchanted with the Canadians, um, the Canadian neglect of their land entitlement and other rights, slowly drifted westward, right? Which was still considered territories at the time. Remember, Alberta, Saskatchewan had not been proclaimed provinces yet. Right? So they were still territories. Uh, the Northwest Mounted Police had been created by this point, but its control over the territory was tenuous at times. Mm -hmm. So the Métis could still have some freedom moving westward, right? And so what you see is in the Saskatchewan valleys, there are new farms centered around Métis um, culture that started to form, right? And Woo! generally farming is farming, but the way that the Métis do it is slightly different than the British way of doing it. Um, yeah, well, no, because it's, it's more about like regenerative land processes, isn't it? Yeah, that and straight up the way actually land is divided is also very different. Yeah. Um, it might seem like a small difference, but for example, it makes the, the land like we've been using British land ways for a while now, and our dirt is dying. Right, absolutely. Um, that, I know that I know people don't understand that, but dirt is dying. Yeah, <laughs> that is an important thing to remind people of. So, but the straight up the division of land was different. So, if I remember correctly, the Miti um, took a more uh, this they they were influenced by the French way of dividing up the land, which was more along square lines um, and. We'll try to keep that in mind because later this would become a problem when 
again, British Canadians would start to come even more westward to where the Métis currently are in our story. Mm -hmm. um, so there was also one of the reasons that they moved to, to what we now know as Saskatchewan is that there was still enough bison left, which was a staple food for um, Métis and a lot of Western Indigenous populations, and that they could still hunt um, in a way that uh, satisfied their cultural needs, right, and mm -hmm. food needs. So it was still not, uh, it was still, you know, enough to offer people of Indigenous and Métis backgrounds hope for the survival of their culture. However, as these things do, it didn't take long for British Canadians to continue moving westward. And this is why I <clears throat> thought it was important to talk about the uh, construction of the railroad is because it has Big straight effects. up effects on how this happened, right? With the construction of the railroad, more and more settlers and immigrants came over to the West. Right? Colonizers going to colonize, baby. Let's go. There you go. And the thing is we have to remember is that the CPR, right, the Canadian Pacific Railway, basically started monopolizing the land and territory around its uh, tracks. So a lot of the land that the Métis had claimed was suddenly being like dispossessed or they were pushed out of it for the benefits of a private company that would then sell it to British and other European settlers in the area. Right. right. And this is where the territorial thing starts to become a problem is that the British system of land, which you still see in places uh, like, for example, if people look at maps of the Eastern townships right here in Quebec, for example, or in Ontario, um, or even pretty much anywhere uh, now in Canada, you'll notice that they're much more rectangular the way that maps are drawn. Like maps and properties are drawn away from the river, right? That's just the way that it's constructed, which seems like a small detail. But when suddenly the Métis and other populations are used to having their land divided up in a certain way, and then you have a people that come in and say, okay, well, no, we're actually going to divide it up this way. And you're not allowed or you won't have access to this land that we're newly dividing. Well, that's where it becomes a problem. Surprise, surprise, right? Surprise, surprise. When someone comes in and disrupts in your entire way of life for no other reason than profit, who knew it causes problems? LMFAO. Except... <laughs> right. I don't think I'm saying anything new here, but it's important, I think, to kind of set the scene in this case. Mm -hmm. By 1884, so almost when the uh, railway is completed, right, all the way to British Columbia, the Métis get, are worried to the point of seeking out Louis Riel again, right? They're mm -hmm. like, this, we've tried to go through legal channels and all that to get our land. It's not working. We need someone who has proven himself to be able to bring people, people together. Going. Yeah, exactly. So let's cut back to Mr. Riel. Oh boy. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting because obviously we won't have time to kind of cover all of it because this is a very broad topic that many books have been written about. Um, if you yeah, want, yeah, and it's also not entirely a topic we're fully equipped to do anyway. That's why I always say, if you want more information or like to read increasing more about it, we always put sources and yeah. extra resources in the description. There's a great book about the Métis written by actually a descendant uh, of Louis Riel, who's oh, called neat. Jean Teye. Yeah, it was a resource for this episode for making it. It's called The Northwest is Our Mother. I don't know if mm. a digital copy exists, but the copy I have is excellent. She explains a lot of the history in very uh, interesting detail. So um, I recommend that book for anyone who's interested. Um, so cut back to Louis Riel. So as we said, he fled to the United States. He was elected to the House of Commons in Ottawa, but never took his seat. Um, and legit, because of this, the McDonald government, I don't know if you knew this, but I found this out while reading the book. The McDonald government actually sent him money in order <laughs> to stay in the States. <laughs> They were like, just as long as you don't come back here, we'll we'll pay you. Just don't come back, right? Mm -hmm. And it'll also provide you amnesty. Like, we're not going to hunt you in the U.S. Just, just stay over there, right? Do whatever you want in the States. I don't care. But you have to stay out. And I think the he had to stay out for five years, basically. So right. enough time for things to settle down after the initial Red River resistance. Right? That's funny. Yeah. There's actually some speculation that he did come back. Uh, to 
uh, sneak into the House of Commons and sign his name as like a bit of an act of resistance uh, to the fact that he was elected but wasn't allowed to take his seat or that it would be frowned upon. But that's kind of subject to a bit of historical debate <laughs> that <laughs> Hiel is kind of like this phantom in the back of people's minds, of white Canadians' minds of like, oh my god, is he around here somewhere and why is this signature? The boogeyman is coming. Straight up. For a long time, he did represent this kind of boogeyman as both an indigenous person and a French person who's able to make it into the halls of power. Like, the white it, Englishman's greatest fear. You laugh, but it straight up is. I know. <laughs> That's why I'm laughing, because I know it's true. <laughs> So yeah, there, there, there's a few great caricatures. We looked at them, not those ones specifically on the show, but there's some good caricatures of the time of actually, I think, if I remember correctly, straight up depicting Riel as like this boogeyman sneaking into the House of Commons. <laughs> sneaking into Alexander McDonald's bedchambers. Right. <laughs> um, there are two occasions, however, in which Riel was uh, known to have come back to Canada. And nothing really ever came of it in terms of legal ramifications, um, but it does set the scene for his eventual trial, which is why I'm mentioning it here. And it's because there are two times that Louis Riel suffered what was diagnosed at the time as a mental health collapse, right? And he traveled to Quebec where he was a patient in two asylums, right? Or two sanitariums, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I think this is, we're not really going to talk about it now in this episode, but it's something that I think listeners should keep in the back of their minds, that this was a known fact that Riel, because of his exile, his self-imposed exile, and all kinds of issues that were plaguing his peoples and indigenous peoples in general, did not mm -hmm. have the most stable or was claimed to not have the most stable of mental right. health, right? Which I can totally understand. Right? Mm -hmm. But spoilers this is going to be used against him <laughs> right um yeah so in the states he had joined a metis community in montana he had married a woman who was also metis named marguerite monet mm -hmm. and they had had three children together but unfortunately none of them survived uh into adulthood no. which you know is sad of course but unfortunately at the time especially in indigenous communities was not exactly um was not exactly uncommon right <laughs> because medical technologies and stuff was not as developed so unfortunately it was more common than today mm -hmm. and this is when he starts to claim that he is receiving visions right which there's a long history of that in indigenous communities mm -hmm. and cultures right this is not uncommon but again something to keep in mind for listeners later as to the type of thing that will be used against him <laughs> at his trial <laughs> So he claims to be receiving visions from God. He's a Christian. So from God of a sovereign Métis state in the prairies, right? So the streams have been crossed. In a sense, yeah. Because like these visions are a very strong First Nations thing. Mm -hmm. They're very, But there have also been lots of political figures, white political figures who have also claimed to get visions from God. Absolutely. Or they've heard the voice of God speak to them. Yeah. So in a sense, yeah, I think you're right. The visions, the the streams have been crossed in this sense. Um, so, but yeah, that, I think that's important to keep in mind is that for a long time, people from all kinds of cultures, and you still see that in, for example, lo, uh, indigenous cultures here, but in more Eastern and Asian and Indian cultures, you see that a lot still, this reliance on more spiritual and um uh, dream-based visions that's a thing right but what i think is important to remember here is that as the 19th century was advancing into the 20th century there was a kind of secularization in a sense or a rationalization of the christian faith mm -hmm. right and things like visions were not as prevalent as they had once been in the christian faith right and i think that helps with the way that people treated Riel's visions despite him being a catholic uh, person I think the way that they approach his visions is more critical because of the shift that that mentality is going through at this moment, and also because he's an indigenous person. Right? <laughs> um, so, yeah. Anything else you wanted to add about that before we keep going? About Louis Riel and yeah, just his visions. Um, well, I think it is something that like because I'm less because obviously if he's saying he has visions and that gets mm -hmm. played against him, then. I'm less angry by like I find there's less reason to be angry at that just because we do that to people who claim to have visions today. Yep. Like I can't count the amount of times that Democrats have latched on to the fact that conservative people run under the platform and that they are like they heard a voice from God telling them to run. Yep. 
But just think, people, I, it makes you definitely makes. I can see why that's a point used against yeah. it because that's a it's an easy pot point. shot. Like, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not even just easy. Like, it is also an easy ground to like to say who. Like, are you claiming to be a prophet now? Well, that's what kind of a lot of people will say about him. Like, in, like yeah. it's the same question that we should have been asking these people who said they heard the voice of God. Mm -hmm. Like, the last person to hear the voice of God was Jesus, who was God. Yeah. And the last person was Moses. Are sure. you saying you are the next Moses? Or Muhammad. Clearly. Or Muhammad? Are you, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Depending on your, are you saying you're the next Muhammad? Like, that is, is a personal attack. Like, yeah. Well, it's a personal attack on somebody's faith in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. It can be viewed as such. Yeah, absolutely. Now, to be clear, like, I'm not entirely averse to the idea that people can have what they consider to be spiritual experiences. I do no. think there is some legitimacy to that. While I'm oh, not 100%. someone who believes in the existence of like a deity as people tend to believe in it uh, as like a single person but like i can understand and appreciate the fact that some people believe to have had uh, believe themselves to have had spiritual experiences <clears throat> that they can't explain in yeah regular human terms right that i'm a hundred percent like i am right. very much fine with it's when it's Oh, how am I supposed to? It's, a, it's when, like, if you have a vision and it's telling you to do something that's mm -hmm. really great, True. but I don't like using that as purely as the reason to do something. True. Yeah. Especially if it's something like creating a sovereign state mm -hmm. or like something that has these large, wide scale ramifications. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's. I, 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 mean, I just, I'm also just a big believer in separation of church, church and, and state. state. Yeah, yeah, sure. I can I can see that being the case, but um, that's the thing. I do like, I do think like like visions are via like they are a genuine thing there, and they can be a genuine part of mm -hmm. somebody's experience. But that's the thing is like people <laughs> will debate it. I have been debating this historically, and they debated this at the time. Is like Hiel starts to have these visions, but he doesn't necessarily act upon them at first, okay. right? Mm -hmm. He just has them, and he notes them down because he's a prolific writer, and you know he. Uh, he's someone who wrote letters to his peers and stuff like that. Like we know what he was thinking and this is just something that happened to him, but it's not at that moment where he actually just went back to Canada and said like, right. this is what I'm going to do. But, and I think to, to, to your point in this case, when the Métis delegation who had left Canada in fear um, of what was going to happen to their culture in order to come to him, that was the impetus that kind of drove him back to Canada mm -hmm. and kind of incited him to put those dreams into practice, right? Like he wasn't driven by the dreams, but he tried to put the dreams into effect, right? Once he had had them. Okay. okay right. That seems, so. at least obviously I'm sure there's plenty of people that can debate otherwise, but from what I've read, that seems to have been the case, right? And interestingly enough, the book that I mentioned earlier um, by Jean Teye doesn't put much emphasis on the dreams as an, as an impetus for his actions, mm -hmm. but she does mention them as being like there, but it's not what pushed him to do it necessarily. Okay, then that's fine then. Yeah. Like if, um, you're, if your spirituality drives you to do certain things, who am I to judge, first of yeah, all? I get that. Yeah, absolutely. So it wouldn't be until June 1884 that uh, the Métis delegation would, um, along with some Canadian settlers actually, arrive in the U.S. to persuade Louis Riel to return to Canada or the Northwest Territories right? mm -hmm. and initiate, at the time, negotiations with Ottawa. Not armed rebellion, just negotiations. We just want to talk at first. But at least having a figurehead like Riel would have allowed him to, would have allowed like more power and more negotiation power. Right? And the five years had been up since 1869, so it was okay for Riel to return to the U.S., uh, mm -hmm. to, the, to Canada, sorry. Among the delegates that went to the U.S., I think, is an important figure who's well-known in Métis history, not only for this rebellion, but after, um, is Gabriel Dumont, who I think we should mention uh, briefly because he's so important, uh, mostly because he's the principal Métis military leader during this resistance, right? Uh, he would lead the armies once things devolved, spoiler, um, and... He, Shocker. Yeah, exactly. Um, he was someone who had already been a spokesperson for the Métis in their growing communities around the Saskatchewan River, but he never had necessarily the same uh, charisma and same attraction as Louis Riel did, right? And so he was a good strategist, but he wasn't necessarily a good figurehead for the Métis mm -hmm. people, right? 
And I think he's important to at least note, even though we're not going to spend a whole lot of time necessarily on him, but I think he's an important figure to keep in mind. For sure. Um, So Louis Hiel would agree to come back to Canada, but from what I've read, the rest of the de- the delegation would quickly realize that Riel had changed since 1870. Like he wasn't, maybe because they saw that perhaps his two stints in an asylum were not the same. Maybe the fact that he had been away from Canada for so long had changed him. Regardless, mm-hmm. he wasn't quite, um, that there was like a difference in what he was. And Teya also brings that up insofar as like, there seemed to be something missing in his way of going about things that didn't quite sit right with a lot of the people that were there. And it's never quite explained in any of the sources I've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just like, he's different. He's, All right. Which is understandable. Like you've, you've gone to an asylum. You had to... You've been away You're forced your to home. leave your country, first of all. Exactly. Another big part of it. For like 15 years. That's a long time to be away from the people you Oh my God, with. he's different. Yeah, no, exactly. Boy. <laughs> mm, wild yeah who knew so by july they would be back in canada or in the northwest territories i should say um and immediately riel and the others began to try to arrange an alliance between the Métis, some white settlers uh who had been unhappy because the pacific railway had not gone where they wanted and so they ended up getting sh- uh, getting basically shafted in the land that they bought uh, as long with some Cree and Blackfoot indigenous populations. Uh-huh. So much more than in the first um, than in the first resistance in 1869, this one is very much one that incorporates more people, right? And I think that was one of the strengths behind it and allowed it to be so um, impactful in many ways was that it wasn't just indigenous people, right? That had grievances against the Canadian government. We're including white people here in this case. And it makes it much um, much more, uh, yeah, I guess, impactful or interesting mm-hmm. to, to consider it. Um, the Cree and Blackfoot in particular were there because they were starving. Right? They, they were straight up going through starvation because of the lack of buffalo. They, it is a known historical fact that the encroachment of white settlers just kind of decimated the buffalo in the West. Oh, yeah, um, buffalo... It's one of those things again where like the the way of hunting was not renewable. It did not give time. It didn't give like like buffalo are not things that grow quickly. Absolutely. Um and so that caused starvation, right? And on top of it, we see this classic uh, the classic issues we've we've talked about many times on the show of feeling shafted again by the way that reserve lands were allocated, right? Or the fact that they were even put on reservations in the first place, right? Rather than allowed to keep their own land. Yeah. Um, so at first, actually, what happened before any kind of conflict was just a petition, right? They got together and they were like, here's a document uh, that we wrote and that we would like the Canadian government to respect. And a lot of the things are things that you'd see today in a lot of communities, actually. So like relief mm. for the Aboriginal peoples that were there, right? Or land disbursements to the Métis populations, easier access to additional land, right? Uh, the fact that they can have elections right, and participate in these elections. Uh, the establishment of new provinces with rights, right? At least as uh, on paper, equal to those that had been established in Manitoba right? And actually rights that would be respected, please, and thank you, right? Um, So all of these would be um, demanded. And similar to Mm -hmm. what we saw with the Bill of Rights that you mentioned earlier, they would very much play the game of the British Canadians by dressing it up in the language of being loyal British subjects, right? These ideas are not radical. We don't want like our own state or whatever. Canada is fine as a thing, but you know, we would like our own rights within Canada, right? Like, yeah. So again, it kind of conflicts with what you were saying earlier about the 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 dreams that Louis Hiel was I mean, having. But yeah, not wanting your own state is good. But then Canada, the, and this is all part of Canada's very long history of battles of going and like lots of people have said they want to be unique, recognized as unique cultures in Canada. Yep, it's caused lots of things that start with ours: sure. rebellions, <laughs> reforms, reformations. And like, reports. I get it. I get the 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 drive behind it. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I... But it's interesting. I, I I do think that when we were talking with Professor Clark, right, and he mentioned at the start of our conversation when he was saying that you know when thinking about 
all these different minority populations in Canada, he kind of right. takes for granted that Canada exists as an entity. It's an unavoidable fact about the world, right? It just is, right? We think we can disagree about like whether it's unavoidable or not, but like he takes it as a fait accompli, right? And I feel like you see something similar in this case with the Métis. And so far as they're like, look, Canada seems to be happening whether we want it or not. At least we're trying to get a good deal out of the fact that it's starting to form in the West, right? We don't want to just disappear. Mm -hmm. And I can get that, right? Um, yeah. Anyway. Unfortunately, so, um, mm -hmm. there was no answer from the government. It was just radio silence. The chirping, <laughs> the chirping insects were just going there and just nothing happened. And this is where there starts to be a bit of tension within the, um, the group that formed and wrote the uh, petition mm -hmm. is that after these three months, there was no reply and Riel and his people kind of immediately set up a provisional government, right? Just like, boom. And this is where their second Bill of Rights comes in, which is aptly called the Revolutionary Bill of Rights. Right. Imagine, imagine if people did that when they didn't hear back from jobs, job right? applications. They just show up anyway and start working. Nah, I don't care. <laughs> and I'm working, so you better pay me. <laughs> I'm not doing anything at home anyway. <laughs> um, so it's not exactly clear who wrote the Revolutionary Bill of Rights in itself, um, but it was adopted uh, by that point officially in 1885, in, the, in early 1885. Um, and have you had time to look at the 10 points that um, form the Revolutionary Bill of Rights? Uh, briefly, I'd have to wait. Let me take, oh, there we go. That, that, that the half-breeds... Their language, to North be yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, they wrote this, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Be given grants similar to those accorded to half breeds of Manitoba, the, that patents be issued to all half breeds and white settlers who have fairly earned the right of possession of their farms, that provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan be forthwith organized with legislators of their own so that the people may no longer be, be subjected to the despotism of Mr. Du Dudney. Dudney was the lieutenant governor of the Northwest Territories at the time. Okay. So the Northwest Territories is just like that big blob of Canada, I guess. Yeah, it's literally the middle of Canada all the way up north. Mm -hmm. Right, so basically from after Manitoba <laughs> to the limit of British Columbia and just go straight north. All of that right. is the Northwest Territories at the time. It's basically just saying, let us be a province. Yep, just absolutely. Make us, make, let us be provinces that have their own way of governance and like can yep. take care of themselves and we'll shut up. Like That's all we want. That's pretty much it, yeah. Um, uh, there was one in particular that I wanted to mention. Um, yeah, the, um, yeah uh, here we go. Number... Um, yeah, exactly. So number six, I think, is really good. That this region be administered for the benefit of the actual settler, i.e. the person who's living there, and not for the advantage of an alien speculator. Um, I think that's kind of an interesting point of saying, like, look, we want, we want to be in control of our own land, right? Of our own destinies, in a sense. And it doesn't make much sense to have it be like just some person, some absentee landlord, perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. Decide of what happens here. That doesn't make any sense, right? So I think that's probably the most revolutionary part of this whole thing is like, we actually want to be con in control of our land. Right? We want to manifest some destiny. Sure. <laughs> but you see what I mean? Like, it's not... It's not like a super inflammatory type of bill of rights in this case. They're just like we want to be. We want to be able to live our lives. Right? Well, it's almost, it's almost just like we want to be part of the country. Yeah, on like <laughs> equal footing. <laughs> like we don't want to just be some big blob of territory. We want to be a province too. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> so this is where it kind of gets sketchy, right? And this is where we'll it'll lead kind of very much into conflict and. Other places, like you said, will, we're not a military history one, so we're not going to uh, podcast, so we're not going to go deeply into the actual um, conflicts oh, themselves, but there's some highlights that I think should be mentioned before we get into the actual literature. And the literature, I think, is important with, uh, with respect to how people reacted to this conflict, right? Mm -hmm. um, so about, um, so not long after the actual provisional government was established at the end of 1884 and beginning of 1885, in the summer of 1885, um, the 
the uh, Gabriel Dumont's troops, right, actually engaged with a body of Northwest Mounted Police officers. Right? There were about 50 of them um, mm -hmm. and about 40 volunteers in Prince Albert, uh, in what was called the Prince Albert Militia, right? Um, sorry, this was not in the summer, but um, the, this was in the winter, I'm sorry, uh, because it was still on like snowy roads. And this was near Duck Lake. Now, it should be noted that this is about a week after the provisional government is announced. So there's radio silence for months when people try to negotiate, but as soon as a provisional government is announced, within a week, there's a militia formed and police oh, no. are on there. <laughs> right. And this is actually yeah. the only conflict that the Métis would win and the uh, indigenous population, which is mm -hmm. why I'm highlighting it is the first one kind of is the only one that they successfully win. Right. Um, it actually only lasted 30 minutes as a conflict, and about a dozen Northwest Mounted Police and militia casualties are noted, and mm -hmm. about 11 people are injured. And so out of the 90 people that were there, that's still quite a bit of the people who either died or were injured. Whereas on the opposite side, the, um, the Métis only lost five people, right? Including uh, Gabriel Dumont's brother, right? Uh, who is named Isadore and the Cree leader, Asiwayan. So some people are lost, but mostly it's a loss for the Canadian um, contingent in this case. Um, now, this victory, right, would obviously encourage the Métis quite a bit, right? Mm -hmm. And some um, indigenous peoples would actually take further action not long after. And while they weren't officially wars or conflicts or battles, they, they are, I guess, part of the wider conflict wherein settlers would abandon their homes uh, and these homes were looted. Um, there are some Cree from Mystica, uh, hold on, Mistahimaska, sorry, uh, if I'm butchering that pronunciation, which in April of 1885 would attack and kill nine settlers, including the Indian agent uh, who was in power at the time. So basically the person who manages the reservation on behalf of the Canadian government. Mm -hmm. uh, he had been killed as well. Um, so there's some action, not specifically against a militia, but against settler populations, right? And while this is not the majority of action that was taken by the indigenous or Métis populations, it is enough to create a fear and a kind of rhetoric that um, Euro-Canadians would very much attach themselves to and be like, see what happens when we let these people run loose, right? They kill our people and loot our homes, right? They're this wild. is unacceptable. Yeah. And thus repeating the savage. The savages. Trope. Yeah. Exactly. Um, however, there's an important reason why Duck Lake is the only victory, right? And <laughs> the, the, the reason was, you know, because of the topic of our last episode. What, what was the major difference between the first Riel Rebellion in 1869 and this one in 1885? What Telegraphs. In, telegraphs and... Guns. Well, yes. The railroad as well. I know. I was fucking with you. But both. Like, the telegraph is an important part as well yeah. because, you know, new technologies are not, are unfortunately not something that, um, or it seems like... Discounted. Yeah, they can't be discounted, but it, exactly well, that. It seems like the Métis kind of discounted it. Yeah, Yeah. So. well, it's also, it's as we, we see it even in modern wars of today, manpower just isn't the way anymore. You have to have yeah. the good technology. Yeah. Like the Ukraine offensive, counteroffensive is working so well because they have very good technolo military technology that's been given to them. Absolutely. Meanwhile, Russia stuff is really old, outdated. Yep, yeah, that seems to be the case. Yeah, and so it would be a similar thing here if people decided to be sympathetic, but... First Nation, so nobody gives a shit. Yeah. So, and I think there's also an important difference, not just technology, but again, like we said, Louis Riel is different. Yeah. Like the fire is a bit more gone from his eyes. The the spirit isn't there. Yeah. Um, it seems like I, I think people really need to take this into account. It's like, so imagine if this had taken place in 1869, right? Or 1870. So if they had been in Saskatchewan, it would have taken weeks for news to reach Ottawa right? Mm -hmm. If not a month or more, right? Depending on the weather. So whereas now from Saskatchewan to Ottawa, it took a day, one day for the news of what happened in Duck Lake, the uh, defeat of the Northwest Mounted Police at the hands of this insurrectionary, uh, insurrectionary force, one day. Mm -hmm. And immediately the Ottawa government uh, puts out requests and calls for volunteers for militia duty. Immediately. 
right? Mm -hmm. So local newspapers across what was then Canada, so from Manitoba to the Maritimes, uh, called uh, for and actually sponsored regiments. And it took only two weeks for almost 8,000 soldiers to be accumulated, right? And brought together in defense of Canada or whatever they, or however it was framed as a, Mm -hmm. basically, you know, this is what you're fighting for. You're fighting for your freedom and the fact that you're not going to be overrun by indigenous populations, even though that was not what they were fighting for. <laughs> right? Yeah, they, they, it was all just, God, it's all so crazy when you look at it, when you take right. a step back. Like 8,000 people, that's massive in two weeks. It's massive yeah. today. It's like, massive, just... especially for Canada. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Right. Uh, granted, Canada was a much smaller place at the time, right? Because we're, we're discounting the Northwest Territories in this case. So it is a much smaller territory. But nevertheless, like to bring together hundreds of people is already something significant. And we have modern te- communicative tools to do it. But with mm-hmm. newspapers, 8,000 people? Like- yeah, 8,000 people. That just goes to show the kind of rhetoric and language they had. Yeah. And how much they had stirred up this nonsensical fear of First Nations people. What I think is important to note as well is that this is not just an Anglophone provinces. Mm -hmm. You see people arriving from Quebec as well, French speakers, right? Um, Which is mostly French speakers. Um, But this is interesting to keep in mind because when the trial of Louis Riel happens, this is where you'll see a divide, right, between the French and English populations. But when it comes to actually defending the idea of Canada, right, then it brings in everybody. So again, I think right. your idea of like the rhetoric is kind of interesting here, right, that they would have used. Yeah. Um, I unfortunately did not take the time to bring up some specific newspaper clippings or ideas that, um, that were I'm said sure at the time. I'm sure you can all imagine it though. Yeah. And they're easily accessible online, I think, to bring it back to the book I mentioned earlier. They, she does mention some, I just didn't copy them now. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, so I think that's an important part. And like, ultimately, after uh, by May, right, the last big battle uh, would take place in this case. So from May 9th to 12th, um, in near Batoche, right, which is a major, uh, more of a significant settlement in the West. Um, this is where Major General Frederick Middleton and Lieutenant Colonel William Otter led basically a two-pronged attack on uh, Cree and Nakota forces, as well as the Métis Provisional Government headquarters, right, which was in Batoche. Um, and funny enough, in kind of a pre-World War I scenario, the Métis would actually use trench warfare during mm-hmm. their... Um, during their uh, either defense or attack. Um, so it's interesting that that was already a technique and I didn't know that, right? But ultimately, um, the Métis were outgunned and despite the fact that they were well protected in a fort and trenches, eventually they ran out of ammunition. And as the, the this happened and the resistance kind of started losing steam, even Riel's charisma and kind of powerful image that he had built up for himself or that had been built up around him was not enough to stop yeah, well, especially people from if he, Yeah, especially if he didn't want to do it. Like, as you said, like you said, he seemed a bit different. Like he's, That's his what time people has claimed, him. yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. And as you said, it was Dumont's troops. Yeah. Mm. So it's, it's, it sounds like a case where they didn't have the same leader that they had before, which really weakens the cause. Yeah, absolutely. And like we were saying, like, there are a lot of things that changed that perhaps should have been kept into, uh, should have been kept in mind. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, on May 12th, after three days, Riel would surrender to Middleton, to General, um, to Lieutenant, Cur- uh, General, sorry, Middleton. And like we said at the beginning, his trial, which is one of the most, if not uh, the most famous uh, trial in Canadian history, will be the subject of next episode, right, that we record together. Um, many of the Cree soldiers who fought with Riel would also be captured and tried. Many of them did flee to the U.S. as well, um, although eight were executed uh, by the Mm -hmm. Canadian government, which is particularly horrific. Um, The idea of execution is actually horrific for Plains Cree, from what I read, because they believe that the soul is kept in the throat. Right. And so being hanged is like a huge affront culturally to them. And so this was like a double whammy on top of it for these Cree populations on top of obviously dying, um, which is terrible for anyone. So I want to finish this episode with two poems. And 
I think this will kind of give us a bit of a perspective on how English Canadians and Métis people would view this conflict, right? Louis Riel himself was a poet, and there's actually collections of his poetry that exist. Um, but we'll talk about his poetry next time, right? Because oh. he, he would write poetry while in prison. And I think it's actually interesting to look at that. Um, and he didn't write much poetry about the conflict itself. He would write some in the first resistance that happened in 1869. But in this mm-hmm. one, he didn't write much, and he mostly wrote in prison. Um, okay. But yeah, there's two poems that I want to talk about that are one from an English Canadian perspective and one from um, E. Pauline Johnson, which uh, who was from mixed heritage, right? English. And I, I don't want to uh, assume, I'm forgetting off the top of my head what her other um, Indigenous heritage is. I want to say Mohawk, but I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first one is called Riel by Kate Simpson Hayes. Um, Not particularly long. Um, This one was written 10 years after the conflict, so in 1895, or at least was published then. Um, What, uh, did you read that one? Uh, Yes. Yeah. This is, which one is this one called? This this short one, Riel. Oh yeah, that one I did read, yes. Okay. What are your, what are your thoughts on that one? Um, it's good. It's very stirring, very rousing, while keeping still a much more natural way of the land. Hmm, Yeah. It's, it's it, like, it's, it's almost interesting, the temporal quality as it goes through battle. Okay. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, I mean, it starts with their sleep almost. It's one wild dream. It's like the sun almost, and then slumbered the camp, the fields were there to see, broken by a war cry, like they're stirring, they're coming to, and then above the din of battle, hollow sounds like this is just them moving through battle now. Yeah. And then finally... The bird that viewed all this, the bird that sort of flew both through space and time, yeah. has now been fly over and is flying gone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the war cry itself is just real. Yeah, and to be clear, she's not, uh, Hayes is not offering a positive view on Hiel. She's very much, well, at least from my reading of it, um, she's not offering a positive view of him. She's offering a positive mm-hmm. view of the land. And I think yeah. that's an interesting distinction to make is like her view, as you were saying, is like, this land is untouched and beautiful and pristine, and we're kind of ignoring the fact that indigenous populations lived on it, but anyway. Um, and then, exactly as you say, there's this bang, and then at the in the last line of the first stanza, the blight of a proud heart's unrest, Riel, right? Specifically relating him to a kind of disease that's hitting mm-hmm. the prairies, in this case. It's a pestilence, a plague upon the land. Yeah. And again, it's like the battle is part of the plague. Mm-hmm. And it's yep. almost, um, if Riel's your battle cry and the people are shouting Riel as they go into battle, Riel has brought the fight, which is the problem. And that's what their issue is with. Yeah. I like, but I don't like, it's it's a bit, yeah, it's a bit terrible to, to do that. But um, it's interesting that the apocalyptic imagery would show up in this case, right? She specifically relates to hell in this mm-hmm. case. Uh line 11 stick and stanza um and over this young land again kind of how is it young i'm not sure because it's millions of years old but whatever um over this young land the bonds of harmony were rudely broken by a fierce war cry and on the swift wings of hate from passion's hell rose hand against brother's hand riel so that's again, almost that's interesting to me because yeah. it's very much equating the metis with the canadian people at large yeah Brothers are when everything from that time seems to suggest that they almost didn't see themselves that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's that very much be. very confusing and very contradictory. Yeah. It's a bit contradictory. And that's why I think that's what I think makes this poem interesting is like Hayes, Hayes's politics shine through in this case of wanting a very specific image of Canada or the Canadian project of this peaceful land of nice people. She's buying into, I think, nice the propaganda. People. Right. Um, or at least wanting to buy into it. But even the propaganda from Canada would be that they are savages. Yeah, that's the thing. Is like I think that's what she's saying in a sense of like, like this Wait, is what worse? we want versus Riel is disrupting this. He's stopping this brotherhood from happening. So where's Hayes from? Hayes, I think, is from Ontario. I'm gonna look it up real quick. Um, but because I believe the, she's the general there. sentiment would have been, would not have been, we we are brothers with the savages. That's always been the idea. Hayes seems to be in a very much a third point to me. 
yeah like this is a totally different perspective of we are one people one where she's so, she's against the fighting mm -hmm. that the english people are brought but she's also not standing with their view of metis people right it's like that's a very separate viewpoint almost so very much make peace make love not war right so kate simpson hayes um lived in a few places but she would have been in the west at the time of the uh, at the time of the re resistance. So mm -hmm. she moved to Winnipeg in the either 1870s or 1880s. And she was still there by 1889 when she had had two, when she was separated from her first husband. Um, she would move to British Columbia though later. Um, so she went from basically New Brunswick westward. Um, <laughs> yeah. So she would have experienced it probably firsthand actually, right? Of... But I, I see also this idea, it's, it's interesting to kind of deconstruct this idea of um, brotherhood because, in a sense, the Métis were trying to, 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 to form this brotherhood and it was rejected, right? They right. wanted to be part of Canada. Maybe that's what she's referring to, in a sense. I don't but know. But then she's blaming Riel. Yes. It's... And that's, again, like, there's a, very, there's, a lot of, there's a very contradictory nature to this poem, which I think makes sense if she's from Ontario living in the West. Like she, she was has, born in New Brunswick, I should specify. I made a mistake. Yeah. There you go. Born in New Brunswick, living out in the West. But still, though, like, she was born in Canada. Yes, yes. Was, was New Brunswick part of Canada at that time? Was it one of the four? Yes, it was one of the four first. Yeah. Okay. I always get, like, I think it's New Brunswick and Newfoundland and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Newfoundland was the last province. <laughs> the, yes. Yeah. The four was Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, correct? Exactly. All right. Yeah. Anyway, I think this is her very unique perspective of her being born and growing up in this place, but now living out in the West. Yeah. And I think that means that she's sort of saying both sides are at fault almost. Yeah. Like you should just let like let them in be let them be a province, but you guys need to stop the fighting. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, like you're at fault for start for kicking this off. In a yeah, sense. you're at fault for but like it's your guys' fault for mm. continuing this conflict. Yeah. I do think it's interesting. I think what makes her um her plea in a sense all the more poignant is the way that she depicts the prairie land, right? Mm -hmm. Almost like a child in a sense, um, or a woman that needs to be cajoled and protected, a young woman. Because not only does she refer to the land, this is on line, uh, line nine, as this young land, right? Which, again, despite the Canadian shield, which would have been millions of years old, if not billions. Um, and also at the end, this is third stanza, third line, uh, fourth line. Upon the prairie's bleeding breast, then a British cheer that ends in a wild wail, from wigwam hear the swell in that deep cry of anguish and reproach, Riel. Um, so very much like uh, in, uh, create, personifying the land in a sense as something that has been personally attacked by mm. this... Um, by Riel. By Riel and his peoples. Um, really? It was attacked? Like... Is that really the hill you want to die on? <laughs> Is it really the hill, though? Really the hill. <laughs> Get it? Yeah. Riel? I'm reeling in the jokes today. hey -oh. But no, I, I, I do think it's, it's an interesting choice of words in this case. Um, and it makes what she's trying to say all the more impactful, I think, to the audience that she's trying to bring it to, which would clearly, I think, have been English-Canadian. I also think there's a very... Because we say English Canadian, but mm -hmm. she doesn't say it's English Canadian cheering. No. Then a British cheer. Mm -hmm. And I think that yeah. plays into this fact that she's more just calling for a peaceful and unified Canada yep. more than anything else. 100%. Um, but again, this British cheer is the one that actively rejected the Indigenous populations and forced their hand into what they, or at least how they saw it as forcing their hand. Yeah. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm not saying she's right to place the blame at yeah. Riel's feet, mm -hmm. but I think I think she's also making a point that this isn't can, these aren't Canadians that are making these problems. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the last stanza? O wild bird, hadst thou raised thy voice not in a note of discord, but in song that would have made this prairie land rejoice to call thee son? But thou didst quicken wrong and left the time, left us time saddest of words to tell, writ in his brother's blood, the rebel name Riel. 
I mean, Riel's the bird in that situation, yeah, right? He kind of becomes the bird in a sense. Which... Well, yeah, he's always been the bird. Yeah. And because he's wandering, he's like, he's lived in Manitoba. He went to an asylum in Quebec. He's sort of going all over the place. He doesn't so have he... a country almost. Yeah. yeah, but she but she also says, if you had done more, if you had picked yourself up off the ground and Pick organized... Pick yourself up by your bootstraps, one might say. <laughs> and helped manifest your destiny, another yeah, might say. exactly. But if you had done those things and said, we don't do this, we do this in, not in discord, but in song is and make the voices come together and harmonize, yeah. we wouldn't be in this situation. You know? If you had not left this up to somebody like Dumal and everybody else, if you had done more with Parliament, which mm. you had a seat in, you had been elected to thrice. This thing that you were not allowed to sit in. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. Would have, like we would have, we would have called you son. You would have made us happy. Nature would have been happy. Yeah. So Instead, basically, if you had bent over backwards to be exactly as we wanted to, it would have been okay. You're right. Like, that's the way I read it. But yeah. Ultimately, like you say, I think Hayes is a good poet. And I think I have an episode planned on her because she would be part of like early suffrage movements in Canada. Um, but I, I have to like disagree with your politics there, dude. <laughs> like, you got so my weird politics flexes. or Hayes? Hayes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I called her dude, but whatever. That's fine. Um, yeah, I'm not not digging not digging your angle here. Yeah, she's been dead for 200 years. It's fine. <laughs> we don't need to respect people who have been dead for 200 years. Tear down all in, the statues. Why don't you? she died in 1945? It hasn't been 200 years. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So she, she, she wrote this poem way after that. She died. Uh, no, this poem. poem was written in 1895 or published. How long in 1895. did she live? She lived. Hold on. Um, she lived until 88, which quite quite old for that time. That's a long time. Like for good time for her. Period. You go, girl. I guess. <laughs> you go, Catherine Hayes. <laughs> um. Okay. I can see the perspective of where she's coming from. Mm -hmm. And I can see what she's trying to say. Yeah. Don't necessarily agree. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, like, this was never a situation that was going to work out peacefully. Right. Like, you, would, you would have to be the best negotiator. And even then, who knows? Because the will of John A. McDonald, yeah. like, even if he's not the one who's fully pulling the strings, he's pulling the strings. This is his legacy. For sure. Oh, yeah. And this will be definitely put and like we'll definitely emphasize how he's pulling the strings during his trial because mm -hmm. there's going to be some shady shit that's going to be pulled during the Louis Hiez trial that McDonald's clearly had a hand in. McDonald's up to all the shady shit. Oh, yes. But I do, I get her point that she's trying to make. I just yep. don't, I think it's a bit of a naive point to make. I agree. Yeah. I think there was never uh, a peace. There was peace was never an option. Yeah, in this case, obviously, I think to her it never was. But uh, um, and don't Riel is not the one really to blame. No matter what side you look at it, Riel is not like these were Dumas troops responding to like Canadian Parliament being dicks. Like yeah, I think he had was still like the person who would have called the final shot on that one. But still, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. still like this isn't like he's not the. I think he was justified in this case. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to just this episode is already like 75 minutes, but I think we can talk a little bit about A Cry from an Indian Wife, which was written by E. Pauline Johnson. Sure. Uh, just like I think just the first few lines I think are interesting because it offers so Johnson, as you were saying, comes from a mixed background. And I think she provides an interesting perspective that's a bit half and half on this whole thing. Um that I think fits well with um with another perspective on this thing. And I'm just going to read the first maybe 10 lines or so, which I think sum up her ideas real well. My forest brave, my red skin love, farewell. We may not see tomorrow, who can tell? What mighty ills befall our little band, or what you'll suffer from the white man's hand? Here is your knife, I thought was sheathed for a, no roaming bison calls it for today, he calls for it today. No hide of prairie cattle will it maim. The plains are bare. It seeks a nobler game. It will drink the lifeblood of a soldier host. Go, rise and strike, no matter what the cause. Yet stay. Revolt not at the Union Jack, nor raise thy hand against the stripling pack, where white-faced warriors marching west to quell our fallen tribe that rises to rebel. Mm -hmm. So obviously, Dang. much more active. Um, 
active politics from Johnson's part, but still not entirely rejecting the idea of the Union Jack in this case. Yeah, I, yeah well, I think they knew that, and again, that wasn't, the, the, the plan was never to reject the government. Exactly. The plan was to become part of the government. I think that's why this one is so important, right? She's not discounting the need or the importance or the ability of radical action to enable change mm -hmm. or the need of radical action in this case, right? Because so many times- You must and take rad radical action to ensure the revolution, comrades. Throw yes. off your chains. <laughs> but regardless of like however you want to spin it, I think this is an interesting perspective. I think the reason why I like this poem more is that it maybe uh, I, I don't find Johnson as capable a poet. I have issues with her with her poetry. I find it very her romantic pose. at times. Oh, yeah. um, her actual poetry. Yeah, but the i think the subject that she's addressing is quite good and also funny enough also bringing up this apocalyptic imagery of things dying around them it's the apocalypse baby yeah but like i i do think that it is interesting of all sides seeing this as a bit of an end game if you will the english canadians seeing this as a threat to their way of life right mm -hmm. the apocalypse coming to the beautiful and untouched prairies quote unquote untouched and mm -hmm. From Johnson's perspective and the indigenous perspective being like, okay, well, no, the apocalypse is us dying because we're going through a genocide right now. Right? We so don't have any food. We, we are literally starving. You killed our buffalo. Right. But still having hope in a better future, right? And I mm -hmm. think that's what makes, um, I think that's what kind of makes both these poems interesting. But I think Johnson's more is that hope for a better future that still arises right not losing track of like this horizon of possibility um i don't know you might disagree but... oh, i do agree i do agree the, the laughing you were seeing me do was more based on like the the star wars memes okay like, what did you receive from the communication hope oh yeah <laughs> i mean not wrong like, no and i know and i think this one does do a better job simply <laughs> by the fact that it does take that stance of we got to work together like and like you guys need to listen to us too like we have valid issues yeah. or there are valid issues being raised here i think there's a, and then we'll we can kind of conclude but there's an interesting passage this is on the second on page 15 of the version i have but it's like it's hard to say like what line because there are no lines or stanzas but um, a bit Stanza. later, um, it says here, um, as prayer is said for every volunteer that swells the ranks that Canada sends out, who prays for victory for the Indian scout? Who prays for our poor nation lying low? None. Therefore, take your tomahawk and go. My heart may break and burn into its core, but I am strong to bid you go to war. I think that's a real good line, set of lines. I mean, <laughs> of like, ain't nobody praying for us. <laughs> so, so at this point, just go, just do it. Like, right. And I think that's really interesting. Just do it. Just, just go for it. All right. Any final thoughts on this one? I think it's a bit more straightforward, but. Yeah, it is a bit more straightforward. Yeah. And it's not, I mean, this is all sort of background. So that way, when we get to the trial, yeah. people, and we can have a bit more depth to understand just what was yeah, actually what's going, going on. on. Yeah. And, and um, I think it's important for people to know just how little has actually changed. Okay. We so we, we I, have made progress. We have made progress as a species yeah, on that. Yeah. But it's also important to note the fact that these are not, this is not totally different than what's happened here in other countries other places in the past. Okay. So I uh, just to frame that as a question, actually, I'm actually curious, and I think what you're saying here fits in with this question, but I'm curious what you see about it. So we've talked recently a lot about using the, the topics that we're talking about in our understanding of history and literature to talk about decolonizing ourselves. Because I do think, I think we both agree that it's like an important step that we need to take, right? To decolonize our minds and to decolonize the way that we operate, right? In Canadian mm -hmm. society. Is there, how do you see this helping us do that, right? I have a specific idea in which I think um, it's important, but I'm curious like what you, how you see that. About decolonizing our minds? Yeah, it's like, is there any way that you see this still helping us understand how to change today? Right, or is it so specific? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. If we don't listen and talk with people, eventually they're going to radicalize. Eventually, right. like, what was it? Two or three years ago, we had Black Lives Matter protests, yep. many of which did get violent, mm -hmm. justifiably so. Sure. 
It's not going to take forever before that happens in Canada. The Oka crisis. Yeah, some of them was, did. <laughs> the, the Oka crisis was what? Nineties. Ninety. Yeah. Ninety. So That's thirty-two. Yeah. Thirty-two years ago. Yeah. Sorry. We're not in twenty twelve, Patrick. That's true. Sorry. <laughs> but still, no. It, like yeah. that was only thirty-two years ago. It can happen mm -hmm. again. We can have another Oka crisis. We can have another anything. Yep. Yeah. You need Absolutely. like this isn't, and it's also something like the Oka crisis. This isn't something new. It didn't yeah. come out of nowhere, springing forth from the minds of the people that, oh yeah, mm -hmm. we're gonna have a violent uh, protest today. We're gonna have a like. It's almost like there are certain material conditions that like pushed people to do this. <laughs> it's almost like there are certain forces in the world, and I think, and again, the, you you you're the you're the one that always brings up communism. I'm always gonna be the one, I'm gonna be the one that always brings up environmental shit. Sure. We're gonna see this a lot more yep. the less resources we have. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Like, the less clean water and food we have from the coming climate crisis, yep. the more riots and revolutions we're going to have. And that's Unless not a surprise. Unless we all decide to work together. It's, it's not, it's not a surprise or a coincidence that a lot of indigenous literature in the modern day talks explicitly about that, about the management of resources. And, and it's not a coincidence that a lot of environmental activists mm -hmm. and a lot of environmental scientists all say, give control back to the First Nations for the resources. They know how to do it. Or, yeah, or just stop doing it the way that you're doing. At the yeah, very stop least. doing it the way you're doing. Listen to the other people, the people who yeah. used to live here. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I would add a second point, and I think it's specifically the point of taking into consideration the changes that have been happening because obviously life is not the same as it was in 1885, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's one of the ways that the Northwest resistance failed was not taking into consideration those changes, right? Life changes. And mm -hmm. while it is important to learn from this history, I think it is also important to learn what they didn't learn at the right. time or didn't take into account. What they In, failed. Yes. Is to say like, no, we need to acknowledge that you know, there are certain forces that we need to contend with, right? Whether it's economic, right? As you were mentioning, or environmental, psychological, whatever, right? All these things. And arguably it makes life much more difficult than decolonizing the decolon decol decolonial process much more difficult because I think it's much more multi-tiered than it used to be. Um, yeah. It's it's still something that I think we need to consider and keep in mind. Any final thoughts? I think this was a good episode. Um, how do I say this? Um, da, 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 da. Any more thoughts? I don't think so. I think you've hit on all the main ones. There was a thought I did have, but it sort of ran away from me. Oh yeah, sort of like Riel did in mm. Manitoba, okay. not Montana. Sorry, but <laughs> yeah, it's just these aren't events that came out of nowhere. As much mm. as we, as much as newspapers, social media sites, and etc., like might like to tell us, these things didn't happen overnight. Yeah. These things have never happened overnight. I think that's it's why always been a build up. That's that's why I like to take a chronological approach to this show is because I feel like it's important to mention all the background information because mm -hmm. these are not lightning in a bottle moments. Right. Um, okay, Mac, take us away. All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, everybody. Or not watching. We don't we don't have videos. No. <laughs> If you liked what you heard and you want to hear more, go check out our Patreon where we have our side series, Pop Canada, run by moi, where we moi? take a much more modern look and approach to the current Canadian cultural landscape. We see how the things we're talking about in this show still affect shit today. Yep. It's a really nice way to make those links. Hell yeah. Recent episodes have included Simu Lui. Oh, what was our most recent? What, did, what the... was the most the Grateful Immigrant one? Was that it? Or was that was it... Simu Louis? Oh, yeah. no, stability in Canada. Yes, that's it. Canada is a stable nation. We have memories. <laughs> we have memory institutionalized. <laughs> now, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to reach out on our Facebook page, Twitter, mm -hmm. email. You can support the show through PayPal. Give us pay what you feel we are worth. We have affiliate links for recommended reading. And again, Patreon doesn't just have the side series. It has extra and ad-free episodes, unedited, unfiltered. You get to hear all of the dumb shit we say. Also, well, mostly what I say. <laughs> Speaking of an email, by the way, uh, we actually got one from another listener named Patrick, right? Who just recently started listening to the show, right? Uh, with episode 61, the one that we did on language rights. And he specifically mentioned you, Mac, because... Yes, the story about the flag. Yeah. So I want to first make it clear about yeah. this is... 
this is about the fact that um, bishops raised the flag first mm -hmm. before. This is Bishop's College School, the yes. high school. I want to make yes. that very clear just so that people know it's not Bishop's University. That's true. In case that was part of the confusion. As for like fact checking, it's more just one of those stories that we were told at school. It's also on their website. I looked it up just out of curiosity. Like it's on the Bishop oh, College's cool. website of saying like that they wanted, that, that they were the first by a couple of hours. Yeah. Which again, to me, is still hilarious. It's very funny. <laughs> All right. I just wanted to mention that. So thank you, Patrick, and other yeah, thanks, listeners Patrick. who want to reach uh, reach out. And yeah, I think that's it. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank Cheers, you. Cheers. Cheers.